The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. The house at the end of the dirt road, where disembodied voices whisper and strange sounds make the living shiver. Where shadows lurk at the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. And mysterious lights speed beyond reason across the clear night sky. Odd events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to where our minds wander, all you fellow wanderers. Yes, hello everybody. And thank you for joining us for another episode. We uh, hope everybody enjoyed the eclipse and that you got to see it safely. Yeah, it was a pretty big deal around here since we were in the path of totality. And dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I know. And uh, I'm glad we got to see it because... It won't be around for like another 73 years. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I won't be around then because that would make me 133. (laughs) I mean, maybe there's a chance. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I'd be 121. So, I mean, maybe we'd see it together. You're catching up to me with age. Well, no, it's still the same age difference. (laughs) Maybe it wouldn't seem... Is big if I know. <laughs> you were 133 and I was 121. <laughs> yeah, it seems like you're closing the gap. <laughs> well, we uh, haven't mentioned Facebook or our merch in a bit, so I want to do that really quickly. If you haven't followed us on Facebook yet, uh, go ahead and check out our page. We post pics related to our episodes, and it's a great place for like-minded people to share their ideas and experiences. And if you haven't checked out our Tee Public store before, you could always give it a peek. There's all kinds of cool stuff that you can get with all different designs that I created. You did a very nice job on them. I know I always say that every time we talk about it, but you did. And uh, the throw pillows are pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a friend of ours got one and... She put it out on her porch, and then she sent a picture to us, and it was pretty big, and it came already stuffed, and it looks pretty darn awesome, I have to say. Yeah, it was an excellent deal for the, for the price. Yeah. I'm surprised how beautiful that pillow is. Yeah. You know, I thought about ordering a couple for ourselves, but we have so many pillows now, I don't know where the hell we're going to put them. <laughs> we have more pillows than any person should own. This is true. And candles. And lamps and chairs. Yeah, let's not go into it. We'll be here all night. (laughs) And lastly, if you'd like to support the show in a non-monetary way, we would greatly appreciate those five-star reviews and comments. Now, we know that many of you have been leaving comments for us on our listening platforms, and we truly appreciate it because it really helps us climb up the lists so we can become recommended. To new people, yeah. I know. Yeah. And we kind of need that. And if you just think about it, if half of you that are listening to us left us a five-star review and a comment, we would just shoot right up that list. So that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm sure it'd make a big difference. That's for sure. Yeah. So, all right. I said it would be quick. um, And I think that's all of the housekeeping stuff out of the way. So I'm pretty excited for tonight's episode. And I'm excited that you are going to be starting us off tonight. Well, you know, I love a good cryptid. The wackier, the better. And this one is uh, something that is definitely right up there. (laughs) Picture this, if you will. Every night at around the same time, the dogs of your neighborhood begin barking, one house after another. As the sound progresses closer and closer to your house, you wonder what the heck is setting them off again. You peer out your front window at the dark neighborhood, but you don't see anything until, just like every other night, your motion-activated outdoor lights turn on. 
illuminating your driveway with such brightness that you're momentarily blinded a little. As your eyes adjust, you think you can see a short white figure walking along the perimeter of your yard. It's not a ghostly figure. You can't see the bushes or the fence through it. It appears to be quite solid. You look away for a split second and look back, and yeah, it's still there. So now you blink your eyes, trying to make sense of what you're seeing because you're right. There is a white figure walking out there along your fence line. But despite your brain telling you that what you're seeing isn't possible, you have to admit, it isn't a full figure at all. It's wearing white for sure, and it's walking with great big strides across your lawn, almost gracefully, despite appearing as though its knees don't bend. But as far as you can tell, it doesn't have any arms. It's just this long, thin pair of white-clad legs leading up to a tiny white head. The entire creature can't be much more than four feet tall. If you didn't know any better, you'd think it was simply a pair of white pants, moseying on by. You stare at this impossible creature as it makes its way along your fence. It doesn't seem to have any interest in you. It doesn't seem to be even looking anywhere except straight ahead. And although it seems to be moving pretty quickly, you get the sense that it isn't really going anywhere with any sense of purpose or urgency. It's almost as if it's just walking along, enjoying the night air, without a care in the world. You keep your eyes on it until it passes beyond your view. A few houses down, the barking dogs begin their alerting cacophony. And then, eventually the air is filled with silence. Your outside lights shut off. You drop the curtain, and shaking your head, you grab yourself a glass of water, shut the TV off, and head to bed. As you settle down in bed, a couple of thoughts pop into your head. First, whatever it was didn't seem dangerous. If anything, it was just out enjoying the night air. And second, no one is going to believe you even if you tell them about it. Because, let's face it, watching white pants topped with a teeny head walking through your yard isn't exactly in the realm of possibility. But... For at least three people between 2007 and 2014, it actually was. They actually saw the cryptid that has come to be known as the Fresno Nightcrawler. I love that name, except when you first told me about the Fresno Nightcrawler, it sounds way creepier than it actually is. Like, if I think Nightcrawler, I think of something that's crawling on the ground in like a menacing, creepy sort of way. But they're actually kind of cute. <laughs> they are in a goofy kind of way. They're goofy. Yeah. yeah. And they're just kind of like, da, 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 as they're walking along. Right. In 2007, a Fresno man who is only known as Jose set up a CCTV camera on the outside of his garage. Now, the best case scenario was that he was hoping to capture some footage of the animal that was bothering his dogs every single night. The worst-case scenario was that he'd capture a person lurking around his house, which would also explain why his dogs kept barking every single night. That night, his dogs did indeed bark at something, so Jose reviewed his video footage, and what he saw was absolutely terrifying. Crossing his yard was an all-white creature that was nothing more than a long, lean pair of pants topped with a tiny head. According to AllThat'sInteresting.com, Jose, who to this day has remained anonymous, was so freaked out that he shared his video footage with three places. First, the Fresno Police Department. Then, with Univision, the American Spanish-speaking TV station. And finally, with Victor Camacho, the host of the Spanish-speaking supernatural program, The Sleepless Ones. The police, by the way, were totally baffled. Pretty soon, the Fresno Nightcrawler footage was all over the internet, and debunkers were doing their best to prove the creature was nothing more than a prankster human. Many argued 
that the Nightcrawler was simply a person on stilts, encased in a white bedsheet. And to be fair, this is kind of what it looked like. Except, they'd have to be the shortest stilts ever, maneuvered by a person less than four feet tall. Now, I think that everyone would have eventually shrugged it off as a hoax or a prank if it was just that one time sighting. But it wasn't, of course. In 2011, park security at Yosemite National Park were hoping to catch some trespassers who were entering the park at night. They set up CCTV on their own, and they did capture proof of some trespassers, just not the kind that they were expecting. In the footage, you can easily see a steeply sloped grassy hill dotted by a few massive trees. And then, moving into frame, from the left are not one, but two Fresno nightcrawlers. They, too, are just moseying down the very steep hill without a care in the world. One is taller, around five feet or so. The other is so much shorter that its head is more pronounced. It kind of looks like those plastic handheld back massagers that you can pick up at Walmart. Like <laughs> like the ones on the end cap that you hold it in the palm of your hand and it's got like the the hands that yeah. the little thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just be bopping down this hill in that Yosemite. Yeah. <laughs> now, both figures are completely white and they walk as though their knees don't bend. In the security footage, they just walk down the hill and then they pass out of the camera's view. Again, the footage went viral and the media went nuts. According to Ranker.com, this was when the Sci-Fi Channel got involved, as well as MUFON. First, the Sci-Fi show Fact or Fate tried their hardest to debunk the footage. Then MUFON tried. But both verdicts were inconclusive. That's surprising. I'm, well, I mean, it is, but it isn't. Because when you look at the footage, you go, how could anybody fake that? But the fact that they tried and yeah. failed says something. That it does. That, you know, they have the technology. You think that they would have been able to debunk this. Yeah. Now, people just couldn't figure out how the Fresno Nightcrawlers could be a hoax. There were plenty of theories, though, outlined by the North American Cryptids.com. First, the footage was simply some masterful CGI or edited in some way. After some scouring, I was able to find a YouTube video done by a guy called Captain Disillusion, who showed how he thought it was done. He simply walked down an alleyway while holding a watermelon at waist-high height and then used editing software to remove the top half of his body. And he did a good job, I'll give him that. But to me, his results don't look anything like the Fresno Nightcrawlers. And most importantly, it didn't prove how the Nightcrawlers were all white and seemed to be wearing some sort of garment that covers their head all the way to their feet. And secondly, it is very, very obvious in his footage that half of his body was removed. Now, another theory is that the Nightcrawlers are simply deer standing on their hind legs trying to eat leaves from tree branches. <laughs> what? I know, but it's out there. People are saying that they're just deer standing on their hind legs. Yes. Okay. Now, the thing with that is that their legs are right, but the height is all wrong. Plus, deer don't walk on their hind legs down steep hills. <laughs> or any type of terrain. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the third theory is that the nightcrawlers are some sort of puppet or marionette, which again doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't see how anyone could pull that off without being seen in the footage. Then, of course, you have the theories of what the Fresno Nightcrawlers could be if they're not a hoax. There are quite a few options for that, too. The first is alien, obviously. The second is that there's some sort of ghost. And the third is that they are some sort of Native American spirit. The Native American spirit theory really gained some traction 
with several online sites alluding to Native American folklore about tree spirits that are trying to warn people to be kinder to the earth. Now, with the Native American theory, that turned out to be a bit of malarkey. No one seemed to have any idea what tribe this folklore or mythology supposedly came from. So, instead of focusing on what the Fresno nightcrawlers are, let's look more closely at what we do know about them. They do seem to travel in pairs, with one generally taller than the other. They don't seem to be much taller than four feet at the most. They do seem to be dressed in all white, and some footage shows that they may have small black eyes. They've never tried to interact with anyone, and they weren't actually spotted in Fresno first. Allegedly, the first sighting actually took place in Manchester, Indiana, back in 2004. An unnamed 17-year-old boy was driving one night after dark, and as he passed through an area of thick fog, he saw something weird. The boy said the all-white creature was close to six feet tall, but it had no arms and appeared to be mostly legs with a small humanoid head on top. The kid freaked out and pulled over, just as the car coming the other way was also pulled over. The elderly couple in the other car allegedly saw the same creature. So, whether that story is true or not, it's impossible to say, since there wasn't any video footage. But in 2014, a former Marine and his wife saw what they described as a Fresno nightcrawler in Carmel, Ohio. And in 2017, someone in Poland captured footage of another nightcrawler. Now, I was able to find and watch the video online, and I'll make sure Beth puts the link in our show notes. The guy filming it seems to be at a campground somewhere. It's very dark, and you can hear young kids playing off in the distance. It looks like there's at least two white figures in the frame, but only one comes into focus for a few seconds. And it is weird looking, and it does move strangely. I don't really know what to make of it. I do think it's interesting that, despite the internet absolutely falling in love with the Fresno Nightcrawler, there aren't a lot of sightings. And to me, if it were a hoax, you'd think there'd be a billion copycats out there, or at least people trying to pull it off for themselves. But you don't see that either. Because it's impossible to do. If you look at that footage, there's no way that those are humans. No. Not when they're that short. I was thinking to myself, could you do it with a drone? But no. I mean, it's it's strange. It really does look supernatural. And they're, like I said before, they're so goofy. <laughs> they really are just kind of like, do 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 as they're yeah. walking. It's so odd just to watch them move gracefully across the lawn. Mm-hmm. Or down sloping hills. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you do see a lot of artists depicting them in posters and other merchandise, but no actual new sightings. So, as far as wacky cryptids go, the Fresno Nightcrawler is definitely one of the best ones. They pretty much defy explanation, and honestly, they're so goofy looking that I'd really like to see one for myself. That is a cryptid I'd like to see for myself, because they're not scary in the least bit. No, not at all. No. But I'm sure they're creepy at the same time because there's no way to explain what you're seeing. It's a good one, honey. I know. <laughs> That's why I picked it for my story. Duh. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and we'll be back right after this short break. Hey, did you know? Researchers in Poland made a pretty remarkable discovery the remains of a Neanderthal child between the age of five and seven, who died 115,000 years ago. This in itself is pretty amazing, but the porousness of the finger bones made them wonder what exactly had happened. After extensive analysis, the only explanation they could come up with was that the child had been digested by a very large bird. Who'd have thunk it? All right, we're back. 
And Beth, do you think your story can top mine tonight? Well, of course. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, what did you think I was going to say? Uh, no. Mine sucks compared to yours. Like, I wouldn't say that. No, I thought maybe you'd say it's as equally compelling. Oh, my story is as equally compelling as yours was. That didn't sound very sincere. Well, you told me what to say. I just said, yes, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> well, you want to tell all our fellow wanderers where your mind wandered for this episode? Yeah, I'm going to a mysterious place because we haven't been to one of those in a, in a while. Are there Fresno night crawlers there? No. There's something that crawls on the ground, though. Ooh. Yeah. Rising out of the rolling green landscape of southern Ohio is an unmistakable shape. Man made out of rounded earth raised three feet high, the curving coils and gaping jaws are undoubtedly a massive snake that stretches 1,348 feet along the earth. Starting with its spiraling tail, your eyes travel along the seven perfectly smooth curves in its body and end with its triangular-shaped head. But you can't help but notice the raised oval shape positioned just within its reach. The oval could be an egg for sure, but it could also be the sun or the earth itself. From the ground, as you walk alongside the serpent's body, now completely covered over in well-manicured grass, you really get a sense of just how massive this animal is and how perfectly curved it is. It truly seems like it could slither past you at any second, which is kind of unnerving. Add that to the fact that the giant serpent sits on the western edge of a crater where gravity's pull is different and rocks stand on edge, and you have one of the most mysterious structures in North America. Especially since no one is 100% certain who built it or when, or how the crater even got there. Sometimes our ancient sites just don't seem to fit the narrative of our understanding of human history. Even archaeologists have more questions than answers, and so all they can offer is a well-educated guess. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, as long as when new evidence is discovered, it isn't quietly tucked away and ignored. So tonight I'm talking about Serpent Mound in Peebles, Ohio. Peebles is in present-day Adams County. But 200 million years ago, the landscape, as you can imagine, looked very different. And not just due to lack of human civilization, but due to millions of years of receding seawater. What is now Ohio was not much more than a dried-up seabed, according to thislocallife.com, made up of layers of limestone, shale, and sandstone. And then a major cataclysm was about to literally shatter the earth. According to Cleveland.com, back in 1997, Ohio's senior state geologist Michael G. Hansen stated that 12 square miles, quote, suffered utter chaos when seven cubic miles of rock was completely smashed. In the center, the earth rose a thousand feet higher than it was before. He called the crater at Serpent Mound a crito explosion, which basically means that nobody is 100% certain how it got there. It may have been volcanic in nature, gas magma may have blasted a hole in the earth's crust, or it may have been a meteor. Mark Baranowski, a geologist with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, stated that there is evidence that something actually hit the Earth there 200 million years ago. Fast forward to now, and a comet or meteor strike 
does seem like the most likely cause of the crater, which actually has an impact zone that's much bigger than geologists originally thought and may have happened even earlier than they originally thought. This LocalLife.com reports that the impact was most likely between 256 and 330 million years ago, and that the projectile left a crater that was five to nine miles wide, instantly crushing the earth beneath it a mile down, leaving sedimentary rock standing upright. At the center, a cone of earth was left behind, a thousand feet high and 600 feet higher than the massive ring left around it. Shatter cones, or areas of rock that have been hit with such force that they've left fan-shaped patterns on their surface, are found all around Serpent Crater. The impact completely annihilated most living things in a 58-square-mile radius. As the Earth healed itself and life reemerged over the next million years or so, the crater began to erode. And then, in 1838, Dr. John Locke, a leading geologist who invented the surveyor's compass, made a comprehensive geological map of Adams County, Ohio. In his report, he noted Serpent Mound for its geological features naming it Sunken Mountain. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the first published surveys of the mound were done a decade later by Smithsonian Institute surveyors Ephraim G. Squire and Edwin Hamilton Davis in 1848. Almost 40 years later, in 1883, Harvard biologist and anthropologist Frederick Ward Putnam came to Serpent Mound. He was so intrigued by what he found that he convinced Harvard to buy the land. He worked at the site for four years, excavating and logging nine different burial mounds, which he actually put back the way he found them when he was done, which is pretty cool for somebody in the 1800s to do that. What exactly did Putnam find? A giant effigy of a snake, stretching a quarter of a mile, positioned east to west across a plateau overlooking what is now called Ohio Brush Creek. In some places, the snake is three feet nine inches tall. In others, it's a full foot higher at four feet nine inches tall. With its spiraled tail and seven body curves, some parts of the snake are almost 25 feet wide. It's huge on the top of this crater. I know, I've seen it. Huge. But that's not all that Putnam found. About 650 feet from the serpent, Putnam discovered a conical mound, which he was pretty certain was also man-made. When he excavated this cone-shaped mound, he found pottery, arrowheads, and human remains. He figured that these were the people who had built Serpent Mount. And yet, he also found remains of a culture that seemed to be younger than the original finds. So, as far as he could tell, Serpent Mound had been used by two completely different groups of people at two very different periods in history. So, Who were they? It wasn't until the 1940s when archaeologist James Bennett Griffith analyzed the Serpent Mound artifacts that he determined that they were either from the Adena culture or the Fort Ancient culture. There just happens to be a 900-year gap between those cultures, by the way. So, there were once several indigenous tribes living in what is now Ohio. But when archaeologists and historians want to refer to all of the tribes as one collective unit, they refer to them as the Adena culture. 
The Adena culture flourished in the Serpent Mound area from roughly 800 to 100 BC. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the Adena culture were hunters, gatherers, and farmers who buried their dead in very long earthen mounds. Some were as long as a hundred feet. They lived in small villages surrounded by gardens. The women did most of the farming, cultivating squash, sunflowers, sumpweed, goosefoot, knotweed, maygrass, and tobacco. They created clay pots, which were more like bowls in which they'd serve an oatmeal-like substance. Despite living in villages, they did pick up and move frequently based on the herd movement of the animals that they hunted. And their burial mounds were pretty ornate. Some, as I had said, were as long as a hundred feet. They would encircle them with small earthen enclosures that archaeologists believe were used for ritualistic purposes. The burial mounds would include skeletal remains, but also bracelets, ear spools, and stone tools. They frequently also cremated their dead. They were also known to build effigies in the shapes of animals. Serpent Mound just happened to be the largest one resembling a snake in the entire world. By 1 AD, the Adena culture basically evolved into the Hopewell culture, which traded in copper and mica. If the Adena culture did build Serpent Mound, then it was sometime between 800 and 100 BC. Although most archaeologists who agree with this theory put the date at around 300 BC, making Serpent Mound a little over 2300 years old. They're basing their belief on radiocarbon dating, as well as evidence of other effigies around the Ohio area. But those who disagree point out that there aren't any serpents in Adena culture artworks. So, why would they choose a serpent if they didn't use serpents in any of their other art? Dissenters against the Adena culture theory also point out that radiocarbon dating at the site was pretty sketchy at best, and that radiocarbon dating can be as much as 3,000 years off, which means the artifacts found near Serpent Mound could be 3,000 years old or younger than 300 BC. They also point out that Serpent Mound was actually renovated in 1100 AD by the Fort Ancient Culture. So then, of course, you're probably wondering, who were the Fort Ancient Culture? They flourished in the Serpent Mound area as well from 1000 to 1750 AD. The Fort Ancient people were really good about reusing and repurposing already existing sites. For example, they got their name from the Fort Ancient site, even though it was actually built by the Hopewell culture, prior to the Fort Ancient people moving in and taking over. And many archaeologists and historians believe the same is true of Serpent Mound, since there's strong evidence of extensive renovation done to the site after the Fort Ancient culture moved in. Initially, Fort Ancient peoples migrated from place to place, briefly settling in small groups of 40 to 50 people. They cultivated corn, beans, and sunflowers, and they lived in pit houses, which were literally what they sound like. They dug large structures down into the earth, hence the pit part, and then they'd cover it over with like a wooden frame or a hatch. So they lived underground, basically. But by the year 1200, they were staying longer in one place, and their settlements swelled up to 300 people. They lived in family units, sometimes with multiple generations living under one roof. Their homes were now more of a cabin style, made out of adobe or wood with peaked roofs. 
Their homes and other buildings were arranged around an open plaza, usually oval-shaped. And that's because they were essentially making a solar calendar from their villages. They were able to align their homes in order to mark the solstices. So it's possible that the fort ancient people renovated Serpent Mound because it no longer lined up with the solstices by the time they'd moved in. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. As they came into contact with other cultures, the Fort Ancient settlements grew until their population might reach 500 people in a single village. They created pottery and cooking accessories like colanders. As their interactions expanded, they were soon trading for European goods like glass, iron, brass, and copper. But it's the symbolism in their art that might tie them to Serpent Mount, because they did use salamanders and snakes extensively in their funerary art as well as in their pottery. So, experts who argue that it really was the fort ancient people who constructed Serpent Mound, say that because the mound mirrors a constellation that they referred to as the snake, and because there's ample evidence that they did pay attention to astronomy, it must have been them. But the thing is, experts have been going back and forth for decades, arguing over which culture originally built Serpent Mound because their carbon dating keeps revealing different dates. It's like one camp conducts their carbon dating and it reveals one thing, and then the next carbon dating reveals something totally different. The latest, like I said, indicates that the mound was originally constructed around 321 BC, putting it firmly in the time of the Adena culture. So, what's the big deal? Like, why does it even matter which culture built Serpent Mound? Well, it's because it's so darn amazing. (laughs) It is. It's so amazing. So, during the summer solstice, the serpent's head aligns perfectly with the sunset. Its tail aligns perfectly perfectly with the winter solstice sunrise. The serpent itself matches the constellation Draco perfectly as well. And even more amazing, the first curve in the snake's body matched perfectly with the star Thuban, which just happened to be the North Pole star from the 4th to 2nd millenniums B.C. So technically, that curve pointed directly at true north. But then there's also what's missing. Specifically, there was once another coil and a pillar stone that may have acted as a marker for the solstices. According to thislocallife.com, the pillar can actually be found on the forest floor below the serpent's head. This pillar itself is unusual because it's not like any of the other rocks in the area, and it's unclear whether it's a natural formation or if it was man-made. Author and researcher Ross Hamilton theorizes in his book, The Mystery of the Serpent Mound, that this pillar stone once stood inside the oval shape at the serpent's head, and it pointed directly at the summer solstice sunset. Hamilton's theory has been further corroborated by more recent findings of other large stones that were apparently once arranged in a complete circle near the serpent's head. So what we see now isn't even what it used to be. There used to be a lot more. The other missing part of the serpent is an additional coil that once existed near the serpent's head as well. 
Using GPR, experts like Dr. Jared Burks was able to determine that this U-shaped feature was almost completely removed in the distant past. So was that also part of the Fort Ancient Culture's renovations? And if so, why did they take it off? It seems pretty obvious that the indigenous people used Serpent Mound as an astrological center, watching the skies and waiting for something. If you're like journalist Graham Hancock, you believe that it was built to record a major cataclysm, namely a meteor that struck the Earth way earlier than mainstream archaeologists like to admit. In Hancock's excellent Netflix special called Ancient Astronomy, he aimed to prove his theory that there were several advanced civilizations building places like Serpent Mound more than 12,000 years ago. And when the world-devastating cataclysm happened, the survivors built massive astronomy centers to keep watch, aligning their focus on the constellation Sirius. Going back over historical records, Hancock was able to prove that at one point, all of the curves in the serpent's body directly lined up with Sirius. He theorizes that the reason snakes are so prevalent in indigenous folklore is because they were the closest known thing people could relate to snakes in the sky, otherwise known as comets or meteors. In many native cultures in Ohio, the serpent eating an egg represents rebirth, which is what the earth would essentially have gone through if Hancock is right. And the thing is, is that it did go through it, but 200 million years ago is the, is the cataclysm that arche- mainstream archaeologists are saying did happen there. That's what made the crater. It's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> Some experts aren't willing to go that far as to agree with Hancock, although they are willing to concede that perhaps Serpent Mound was built after the indigenous people witnessed Halley's Comet soaring overhead in 1066. Which makes sense if you're on the side of the fort ancient culture having built the mound. Or I would say maybe they renovated it after Halley's Comet. And whether Graham Hancock is right or wrong isn't really my point. I think it's pretty darn amazing that whoever built Serpent Mound built it on the exact spot where a meteor hit the earth and used it as a spot to watch the skies possibly renovating it when it no longer matched up perfectly with whatever they were trying to observe. Lastly, I had mentioned that there are strange gravitational anomalies at Serpent Mound due to the fact that it was a meteor crash site. Storms apparently stop right at the edge of the crater and dissipate. People's car batteries and phone batteries drain remarkably fast. And compass needles don't behave the way they're supposed to. Almost all of the sites that I looked at mentioned the idea that there was no way indigenous people would have picked up on these things. But I personally would argue that they probably did. You don't need a phone or an automobile to notice that storms stop at the edge of a crater. And you don't need a compass to tell you that your own sense of gravity feels a little off in a certain place. I think the indigenous people of the distant past deserve more credit than that. I mean, if they can build a place like Serpent Mound, why would we assume that they weren't in tune with what was going on around them? They were probably more in tune than we are in a lot of ways. Oh, most definitely. They do not get the credit that they deserve. No, not it's when they were building places. the way we like think it. of indigenous people or cultures way before us. Like they couldn't possibly have the technology or the brain cells to do something like this. Mm-hmm. 
But you look at their stuff. We don't build anything like that anymore. Which is why I was saying in the very, very beginning, that's fine. Have your ideas, but be willing to consider other things when the evidence is so obvious. Yes. So to end, I'd like to leave everyone with a quote from the OhioHistory.org website about Serpent Mound. It says, quote, From the diversity of its modern visitors, it is clear that Serpent Mound means many things to many people, yet it is little understood by archaeologists today. Questions persist about its date, its builders, and its meaning. ARC director Nancy Stranahan ponders this sense of mystery. Serpent Mound is a truly powerful, sacred site. I actually feel very humble trying to give voice to it, but I can tell you how it affects me. A serpent is the symbol of mystery. We don't understand it. We know almost nothing about it. When we interpret it, we mostly tell what we don't know. In that, I think, lies its power. We feel we know so much, and yet we mostly live in an unknown universe. And I think Serpent Mound is that gateway to remembering that we don't really know anything. What we know is a particle or grain of sand on a beach. I think that pretty much sums it up. Yep. I thought that was so amazing that it came from the official Ohio history website. That that's what they quoted. We don't know anything about Serpent Mound, for sure. Other than it was amazing. It is grand. It's just, it's, it's a marvel to look at. Mm-hmm. And I think with our technology, we think we're so ahead of everyone. Right. Like, oh, no other civilization was as advanced as we are. It's just not true. Right. Right. Well, was it as good as yours? It was better than mine. <laughs> I was like, oh, in the silence, which way is it going to go? <laughs> well, I love S- Serpent Mountain. You know this. Yeah. But, I mean, for anyone that hadn't heard about it, what you did there pretty much sums it up for anybody that has never heard of it. I think that it's a pretty clear cut idea of exactly what's going on with it. Well, thank you. I can dust my hands off, do the drape mock, the drape mock, (laughs) the mic drop. Right. (laughs) Wow. (sighs) If we were battling, you would have won this. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as always, if you'd like to know more, you can check out our sources in our show notes. Um, I will put in the Fresno Nightcrawler videos that uh, Wes referred to. They're so cool. You got to check them out. You got to check them out. I would love to see people set different like background theme music (laughs) to them walking down the hill. I know. it's. (laughs) It reminds me of something just walking and... Pajamas that are too, way too big for them. Yes, but they're so short. With the short. wind blowing. You yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's, it's just mind-numbing. Yeah, with no heads. I definitely get a kick out of them. It, I would almost feel like you'd just want to run out there onto the lawn and give one of them a hug. I know. <laughs> yeah, they're almost Gumby-like, but yes. they're too skinny to be right. Gumby. Like, yeah, they are very... If you don't know what we're talking about, just check them out. Just Google them to see what they look like. Well, with that said, that about wraps it up for this episode, Beth. I think so. Want to tell everybody about our show notes? I already did. Oh, did you? (laughs) You weren't paying attention. Oh, my. I already said that. Well, it was a big dinner, and I was kind of uh, dozing off after that. It's very warm in here right now, too. I'm very, very warm. And my glasses are fogging up. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably just because you're around me. That's gotta be it. I know. Well, join us next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. See you soon.